Greetings and welcome to the seminar on Biosafety and Biosecurity Month. I would like to thank Ames University for inviting me to deliver this lecture, which is entitled Fundamentals of Biological Agents and Risk Groups, What Laboratorians and Stakeholders Should Know. This lecture is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. You are free to download, reuse, and remix the contents of this lecture. In this lecture, I will introduce you to certain terminologies, such as biological agents and biological assets. I will introduce you to the AMP model, which pertains to risk assessment, risk mitigation, and performance assessment. You will be introduced to biological agents, the risk groups, the routes of transmission, and the portal of entry. We will also discuss current events with respect to the genetic engineering of biological organisms. Now, when we look from the perspective of a biosafety officer or a bio-risk manager, there are two areas of concern as far as biological agents are concerned. These include the lack of oversight and intentional release. Now, lack of oversight pertains to biosafety issues and intentional release pertains to biosecurity issues. An increasing amount of work is being done in the area of genetic engineering of biological agents. And if there is a lack of oversight in laboratories conducting this kind of work, there is a likelihood of a breach of containment and a pandemic. So lack of oversight is one of the areas in which we must focus on in order to create greater awareness. The other area is intentional release. Of course, that does not concern us as it is in the domain of the defense and security agencies to ensure that the national boundaries are protected from biological agents. However, if we are involved in any work that can result or lead to the development of a biological agent that has the potential to cause harm, we must inform the authorities and obtain consent for this kind of work. And this is the case in most national jurisdictions. Many countries are signatories to international conventions on the elimination of biological weapons. And this is one of the criteria which needs to be adhered to in order to ensure that there is no intentional release of biological agents. For those of you who are not aware, I will briefly introduce you to the AMP model and the context of this lecture within that model. So the AMP model, which was basically developed by Sandia National Laboratories, focuses on risk assessment, risk mitigation, and performance assessment. And this model is cyclical and based on the principle of continuous quality improvement. So we first assess the risk posed by a biological agent. We then mitigate the risk by the application of five controls and we conduct a performance assessment based on our audits and observations of practices, as well as accident and incident analysis. Now, risk groups are basically defined or characterized by the WHO, and we focus on risk groups during the process of risk assessment. Let us delve into the concepts of biological agents now, for those of you who are from microbiology background, you must be aware of the various organisms, or what we refer to as pathogens, which can cause harm in healthy human subjects, as well as in animals or plants. Now, when we speak in the language of the biosafety officers or bio risk managers, we focus on these terms, which are biological agents and biological assets. Now, if I'm speaking from the perspective of a biosafety officer, I will speak or refer to the term biological agents. However, if you are speaking from the perspective of a biosecurity officer, you will speak in terms of the biological assets. 
So this is an adaptation of EU Directive 2000-54-EC. So biological agents are technically defined as any microorganism, including those which may have been genetically modified, cell culture and endoparasites, which may be able to provoke any infection, allergy or toxicity in human, animals or plants. Now this definition encompasses humans, animals, as well as plants, as many biological agents can pose a threat to economic activities pertaining to agriculture, as well as public health and safety. The first biological agent, which I will introduce you to, are the viruses. So a virus is basically a non-living organism. It's composed of a core, which is of nucleic acids, either RNA or DNA, and this core is encapsulated in a protein coat. Viruses are classified in terms of the Baltimore scheme, which basically classifies viruses based on their nucleic acid composition, either RNA or DNA, which can either be single-stranded or double-stranded. Now, one of the reasons why viruses are a cause of concern from the perspective of a biosafety officer or a bio-risk manager is their ability to mutate. And mutation can result in both lethal strains as well as benign strains. And the ability of viruses to mutate within the host is one of the causes of concern. In addition to this, we also have what are termed as zoonotic viruses, which can be transmitted from animals to human hosts and vice versa. And the ability of viruses to be transmitted via multiple routes, including aerosols, is another cause of concern as respiratory viruses can escape containment or there can be a breach of containment even if there is a single index case or an infected individual. Some of the viruses which are a cause of concern are the avian influenza viruses, which are respiratory viruses, Ebola viruses, coronaviruses, HIV or human immunodeficiency virus, dengue virus, West Nile virus and the rabies virus. Now, many of these viruses pose a threat to public health and safety as well as a threat to the economy. As the current pandemic has proven, viruses affect or impact the economy at multiple levels and can cause disruptions in everything ranging from food supply to the global supply networks. The second biological agent, which we commonly know uh, bacteria. So within an organism, there are both commensal and symbiotic bacteria, and these do not necessarily cause harm unless they acquire traits via horizontal gene transfer. Pathogenic bacteria harbor specific genes which encode toxins, and this can be located on the genome as pathogenicity islands. Now, the reason why pathogenic bacteria are a cause of concern is because they have the ability to transfer these pathogenicity islands via the process of horizontal gene transfer into benign bacteria. And there is a potential for benign bacteria to be transformed into pathogens via horizontal gene transfer. Another area which is currently being addressed is multi-drug resistant bacteria that have evolved or emerged as a result of the extensive use of antibiotics and other antimicrobial drugs. And this poses a significant challenge to the healthcare industry. The other causes of concern are the nosocomial infections or the hospital acquired infections, in which case a patient may acquire an infection via the hospital or even a laboratory worker may acquire what is known as a laboratory acquired infection via working with a biological agent. Bacteria which form spores such as mycobacterium tuberculosis are a cause of concern as they can be distributed or spread via aerosols. These are some of the most commonly known bacterial pathogens 
we have mycobacterium tuberculosis and there has been an increasing trend towards antibiotic resistance in the case of this bacterium. We have Escherichia coli, the pathogenic strain, which is spread via uncooked vegetables or via water. Vibrio cholerae, Helicobacter pylori, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and its variants, and the Salmonella typhi. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is attributed to, has been attributed to laboratory acquired infections and it's a cause of concern to laboratories and hospital workers. Fungi are less common in terms of their infectivity. We have some fungi such as Aspergilla species, Histoplasma and Cryptococcus. However, these primarily infect patients who have been immunocompromised or those individuals with immunocompromised systems. Now among the fungi and yeast, candidiasis is a fungal infection which is caused by the yeast called candida and one of the emerging pathogens is candida auris which is multi drug resistant and very difficult to detect using standard diagnostic procedures. However, infections from fungi and yeast can be controlled effectively using multiple therapeutic approaches. Now, among the other biological agents, we have what are known as parasites. And these are of special concern in biosafety facilities conducting research involving live animals as they can be transmitted from the test animals to the laboratory workers if there is no adequate risk mitigation or controls. The other area of concern is biotoxins such as ricin, saxitoxin, colchicin and ibrin. These are derived from organisms such as bacteria as well as plants or even what are known as the algae and this can cause harm in human hosts as they are neurotoxic. What is rarely known or what is less known is the prion diseases which are responsible for the neuro, ne neurodegenerative disorders that affect both humans and animals. And this was the case in what is termed as the mad cow disease which infected cattle and was subsequently transmitted to other hosts via consumption of uh, the meat. Among the toxins, we have the natural toxins, which are the saxitoxin. This is the saxitoxin. It's actually derived from a marine organism. And we have the nerve agents. Now these nerve agents have been utilized for poisoning different people and there have been news reports about the usage of these nerve agents and if they are basically produced by state actors, they are, the state actor is in violation of the Convention on Biological Weapons. So they are basically breaching certain international treaties when these are employed by state actors. However, these are very dangerous as they can cause severe neurodegenerative issues or diseases in patients to whom they have been administered and they are also very infectious at a very, very low dose. Now, we move on to what are known as genetically modified organisms and this is the area which is of special concern to biorisk managers and biosafety officers primarily because this kind of risk cannot be categorized into any of the risk groups. A very simple example which presents itself to us in the current pandemic is the mutations in the coronavirus. And these mutations increase the lethality or increase the risk of infection and the risk of mort mortality and morbidity. And these cannot be predicted now, surprisingly, it is relatively easy to genetically modify a virus due to the emergence of a field which is known as 
synthetic biology. You can synthesize any genome for a few thousand dollars and you can then transform cell lines with these genomes and produce synthetic viruses. Now, although this is an area which is of relevance to science as experiments such as RNA interference require genetically modified or synthetically developed genomes, it is a cause of concern because there is something termed as the gain of function experiments. Now, gain of function involves the introduction of a specific gene or set of genes which increase the virulence of a known biological agent. For instance, if you have a virus which is not infectious, which is not benign, and then you introduce a receptor for a certain human cell type which makes this virus more infectious, you are actually involved in a process known as a GOF or a gain of function. Now, gain of function experiments have been curtailed or banned in many countries around the world. However, they have continued to be undertaken or basically there is a lot of experimentation in gain of function as this involves research and there is a emergence of what are known as DIY or do it yourself biologists who can synthesize genes and order them on an uh, online portal and then set up a simple experiment in their backyard or in their workshop and produce these modified organisms. These are relatively simple to do and can be done at a very low cost and this raises the specter of the development of biological agents without the defined functionalities. The other area is the DURC or the dual use research of concern and this is of concern to biorisk managers because certain research elements which are scientific in nature or required for the improvisation or the increase in the knowledge, develop, uh, the progress of knowledge can also cause harm. And DURC is one of the aspects which every biosafety officer must be aware of when working with modified biological agents in a laboratory setting. As a breach of containment can result in an unprecedented risk to the general public. And this brings us to CRISPR. These two remarkable women have been awarded the Nobel Prize for the revolutionary, what are known as genetic scissors. Now CRISPR is a very highly specific genetic engineering tool which can be utilized to insert genes into specific regions of the genome as well as delete genes from the genome. And CRISPR raises a new challenge to the biosafety community as Again, as I said, if any organism is developed using CRISPR-based technology, the risks will be unknown. We now move on to risk groups as classified by the World Health Organization. So we have four risk groups. Risk group one poses a low individual risk or low community risk and it's a microorganism that is unlikely to cause harm in humans or animals. Now, this can be an example of a bacterium which may cause mild morbidity, but no mortality. So risk group one, infectious agents can be treated using normal antibiotics and therapeutics. Risk group two poses a moderate individual risk and a low community risk. So this kind of pathogen cannot be transmitted readily from the individual to other members of the community. And it does not pose a serious threat to laboratory workers. However, laboratory exposures may cause severe infection and the effective treatment is available. So this concerns all biological agents which can cause harm to the individual but cannot be transmitted readily from the individual to the community. In this case, suitable measures for containment can be adopted to limit the risk to the general public. 
Now, risk group 3 poses a high risk to the individual but a low community risk. This group of pathogens infects individuals. However, effective treatment in the form of vaccines or other therapeutic measures are available and it does not pose a risk to the community due to the low risk of transmission. Finally, we have the most dangerous risk group, which is risk group 4. This risk group poses a high individual risk and a high community risk, and it causes serious harm in both the individual as well as in communities, and there is no effective treatment, there is no vaccine available, and there is a very high rate of morbidity and mortality. So this is risk group 4, and this is especially true in the case of respiratory viruses or viruses which are transmitted via aerosols. Now, regional factors impact risk groups, and as the current pandemic has shown us, certain mutations may have an advantage in terms of their infectious cycle as compared to the other biological agents. Now, there are variants of organisms, so the pathogenicity of an organism can be linked to the variants in the form of various mutations. The second regional factor which influences a risk group is the mode of transmission. For instance, if you have a highly populated area with a dense population, there is a likelihood of higher rates of transmission and a localized infection, what are termed as clusters. And the regional factors also include mobility. For instance, one of the reasons for the lockdown or the movement control orders is to limit mobility and limit the spread of the biological agent. In the case of zoonotic agents, the presence of vectors, for instance, dengue, mosquitoes, is one of the areas which can be controlled. For instance, you can control the mosquito population or the insect population and in turn control or limit the spread of the biological agent. And there are environmental factors for instance, if you have read in current literature, global warming or the increase in global temperatures has been linked to the increase in the number of pathogens due to the shift in temperature patterns. So these factors influence the evaluation or the assessment of the risk group. We also have to be concerned about local av availability of effective preventive measures in the terms of vaccines and other therapeutic drugs. For instance, in a poor country or a less developed country, there's a less likelihood of accessibility to a preventive measure. And this can be a cause of concern or it must be taken into account when conducting a risk assessment and the local availability of effective treatment. We now move on to the routes of transmission. And there are multiple routes of transmission. And this is one area which we must reiterate during public discourses. As many of the public or the members of the community are not aware of the routes of transmission. So one of the first routes of transmission is direct contact via the tissues or flu fluids from infected individuals. And this requires the application or the usage of proper PPEs in accordance with the standard operating procedures. The second area is the fomites. So inanimate objects such as doorknobs, toilet seats, glass windows can hold or basically serve as a surface for the transmission of biological agents and these must be sanitized frequently. The third one is aerosols. Of course, everyone is aware of aerosols now because the pandemic is basically being propagated via aerosols. So the COVID-19 basically transmits itself via aerosols and we must put into place effective measures for the containment of aerosols, either generated by humans or recirculated through, for instance, the air conditioning systems in supermarkets and the public places. The fourth route is the oral route, and this is a less of a concern, especially in the case of 
bacteria. However, if the bacterium is pathogenic, such as Escherichia coli or uh, Vibrio cholerae, this can cause severe morbidity in patients. The fifth one is vector bone. So this vector bone transmission can be contained by controlling or limiting the spread of the vector itself, such as the mosquitoes or, for instance, the helmets or the worms. And finally, we have zoonotic pathogens. Now, zoonotic pathogens have increased in terms of the, uh, the uh, transmission factor as an increasing number of individuals are living at the peripheries of, for instance, forested areas. And this has resulted in the increase in the prevalence of pathogens which are transmitted via zoonotic agents. Now we look forward to the portal of entry. So the portal of entry is basically the ma manner by which a pathogen enters a susceptible host. So we have the respiratory route, the fecal oral route, and the ocular conjunctival route. Now in order to understand the risk posed by a specific biological agent, we must analyze the portal of entry. Once we have the portal of entry Within our understanding, we once we understand basically the route of transmission and the portal of entry, we can then propose measures to mitigate or limit the risk by application of the five controls. So we have five controls which are basically elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. And these can be applied concurrently in order to limit or mitigate the risk of transmission of the biological agent via the different portals. We also have the cutaneous route via the skin. So fortunately, we do not have viruses which can be transmitted via the skin. So we'll have another issue when it comes down to containing pandemics and percutaneous, which is below the skin via injection. So usually in laboratory systems, when we have a needle stick injury, and we are working with the pathogen, this falls into the area of percutaneous portal of entry. And we have the last one, which is the mucous membranes. Now, some biological agents can enter through the human host or the animal host via multiple routes. And this is what must be addressed during the risk assessment. So we have come down to the end of our lectures. And in this presentation, we have looked at biological agents, which are viruses, bacteria, fungi. We also have the toxins and the prions in this example. We then moved on to the risk groups. So we have the four risk groups and the degree or the level of infectivity, morbidity and mortality, as well as the transmission is different in the case of different risk groups. We have looked at the route of transmission and the portal of entry. Now, when you are a bio risk manager or a biosafety officer, you must be aware of the concept of the risk group. And the risk group can be obtained from a specific website, which is the pathogen safety data sheet. So I will share this with you in the links. And this pathogen safety data sheet is a very useful resource which informs you of the known pathogens. However, when we conduct an assessment for an unknown biological agent, we have to look beyond the risk group itself. And there is another caveat, which is the case of the other potentially infectious material. This may be a cause of concern when you are working with hospital samples. For instance, you are a laboratory worker and you receive a sample of serum from a patient who is COVID 19 positive. However, that patient has also been infected by maybe hepatitis virus as well. So when you're working in the laboratory with this kind of hospital acquired sample, you are basically encountering multiple risks and the biosafety officer at your specific facility must be aware of the challenges posed by hospital samples, which may consist of multiple biological agents. 
We have also looked at the route of transmission and the portal of entry. Now, all of these factors are very important when we conduct a risk assessment for a specific biological agent as the measure which we use to mitigate the risk or the control is based on the specific aspect of the biological agent. With that, I would like to thank you for listening to this presentation and I will now take questions from the participants and answer the questions which are available in the chat window. Thank you very much and stay biosafe.